I wish to thank President Von Braun and Chancellor Sanchez Sarando for the opportunity of making this presentation, which will focus up on an update of testing and the development of COVID-19 vaccines. And next slide, please. And thank you. Uh, in these initial remarks, I wish to contrast the experience of China in controlling the epidemic. And in this week, um, importantly to observe that nearly 500 million Chinese will be traveling within the country as evidence of control of the outbreak. I also wish to contrast the data of the number of deaths at 4,000, the total cases of 85,000 in a country of more than 1.5 billion people. And contrast that to the next slide. And can you, yes, thank you. In the United States, there are now nearly 7.5 million cases and 209,000 deaths. The dismissal of science within the United States is important to observe. There has been a decimation of institutions, scientific institutions, the NIH, the FDA, the CDC, all importantly, bringing science to the control of the pandemic. Meanwhile, as has been mentioned, politicians rule the day in receiving the very best of health care and at the same time, regrettably, downplaying the risk of COVID-19. In our presentation, Anne and I will now wish to focus upon science, the importance of science in contending with the pandemic. And if you could go to the next slide. Dr. Woolley is at the forefront of the uh, contending with the pandemic. She's a brilliant clinician scientist who uh, is involved in the development of the vaccines. And she will discuss the science of the virology the evolution of testing, an update in the development of vaccines, for me then to make concluding remarks that will bring us back to the important message of WHO Director Tedros. We must have solidarity in the application of the science to control this pandemic. Dr. Woolley. Thank you, Dr. Delmonico. So just to start to ground our presentation in the science and the virology of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which will not be anything new to uh, you all, but just to remind ourselves that this is an enveloped positive strand family of single string stranded RNA viruses. We commonly think of seven coronaviruses that have been known to infect humans, four of which are common and cause mild cold-like diseases as compared to the three that have been rarer and can cause severe respiratory infections. These are often transmitted to humans from animals. When we think about severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 1, or SARS-CoV, as well as the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus, or, MER or MERS-CoV, they were both transmitted to humans from bats by cats and camels, respectively. So when we think of SARS-CoV-2 uh, virum, we know it's a large genome. There are four structural proteins, the S or spike protein being the most important, the receptor binding domain, which then binds to the ACE2 receptor, which is widely distributed throughout the body in both the upper and lower respiratory tract, the GI tract, and as we're learning more, the cardiac and neurologic tissues as well. So I'd just like to highlight before we get into testing, the disease course and as we understand it now for COVID-19. So what I have here in the middle is the different periods of the clinical disease. So as we know now that the incubation period, we believe to have a median five day time period, but ranging anywhere from two to 14 days. Then when you go to the acute mild phase, though the symptoms can be quite vague and this phase typically lasts about a week. 
The concern is then often into week two, often between seven to 10 days post initial infection when we then worry that you can develop this pro-inflammatory phase, which seems to be very unique and different from other viruses that we have encountered. And this is then when often we experience acute respiratory distress syndrome in our patients. Often the duration of this phase, as well as who get, develops this phase, has a lot to do with other comorbidities, be it also other factors, including age, body mass index, cardiovascular risk factors, et cetera. And then we know there is a recovery period, and we are learning more and more about how long that recovery period is for many individuals, and are still, link, are still trying to understand who is more impacted by having this long recovery period, and therefore having had uh, impact of this disease, despite maybe perhaps only staying in the acute mild phase. Now, when we think about this in terms of testing, who should we be testing, and when along this disease spectrum should we start testing. So here again is similar, as you see in the arrows here, the incubation period, symptomatic illness, and convalescence. So we know we have at our um, disposal now, due to much uh, advanced, is, uh, must advancements in diagnostics just beginning since January, that we're able to intervene at these different time points. And so I'll go in more in depth as to which testing, but I first want to highlight the fact that has been a, um, a matter of quite debate, I'd say, over the past six months, that now I think most our scientists are in agreement with this importance for screening asymptomatic individuals. And the reason for that being the fact of how to actually contain this pandemic with trying to minimize transmission. So this was an excellent review out this summer in the Annals of Internal Medicine that pulled data from 16 different cohorts and incorporated more than 40, 45,000 individuals. And this showed that 40 to 45 percent of people with SARS-CoV-2 actually were asymptomatic. And since then, there have been other modeling studies that estimate that asymptomatic individuals account for well over half of all transmissions. And yet, you might wonder, why is it that we still need to discuss the importance of testing programs to, inc to include asymptomatic individuals? And well, for those programs that do exist, how do we actually act on these? What are the right tests to use in the right populations? And how do we know that we can rely on this testing? So this is just an overview when we think about the three different types of main tests that we have for diagnostics for SARS-CoV-2. The first being molecular tests, which are highly sensitive, highly specific, often expensive, and have longer turnaround times, and perhaps often have bottleneck issues for being able to actually administer these tests to individuals. Then we have the antigen tests, or the rapid tests, that detect proteins from the virus that I will explain more about. And then we'll touch upon antibody tests, which we, as we all know, are what they use to detect more in the convalescent period as to whether or not individuals have been infected with this virus. And there's so many questions that are yet to be answered as to the significance of antibody testing and how important is it and who should we be using it for? And what does it mean in terms of uh, in, uh, developing additional symptoms or the infection again? So this is just a graphical design, a slide, excuse me, to highlight the different types of molecular testing. So though we know molecular testing is PCR based, and as I mentioned, is highly sensitive and highly specific, when the middle picture shows the more conventional approach, which is the nasal pharyngeal swab. As we all know, it can be often a deterrent for many individuals to get tested. It's not only very uncomfortable for individuals to have this test, but it also requires significant PPE for the health provider who is collecting the sample. And therefore, in thinking about trying to expand and increase widespread testing, it causes a lot of bottlenecks due to all these issues. So on the left, we have the anterior nasal swab which has really been first thought for certain flu studies, but it really hadn't had much acceptance um, until SARS-CoV-2. And I'd say in the past three to four months, there've been more and more studies showing validation between the sensitivity and specificity of an anterior nasal swab, which is basically just using something similar to a Q-tip in the um, small portion of the nose without causing any discomfort and can be done with, through self-collection, 
either observed or unobserved, and having the same performance mechanism as we see in nasopharyngeal PCR testing. And on the right, we show a picture of the saliva testing, which is really what is hopefully going to be something that we can do more and more since that is much more economical in um, actually what the test costs. However, it's a big burden to labs. And that's why, though we have great data on it now, and this is a validation study that was out recently in the New England Journal of Medicine that from Yale that showed the fact that when they compared nasopharyngeal swab samples to saliva samples, that the performance characteristics were very comparable and if not slightly improved with the saliva samples. The problem with this comes to the actual lab, having a high throughput lab, which is so critical to be able to perform this testing for such a large number of people, particularly when we talk about surveillance testing and not just limiting this to symptomatic individuals. And so that's why, unfortunately, in the US, saliva testing has not picked up widespread, though it is in certain pockets. So now we think about rapid antigen testing, and I have here on the left the Binex Now, which is the Abbott testing that received um, EUA, emergency use authorization from the FDA in the US in the beginning of September. It has now been very much in the news given the fact that this is what the White House has been using to um, do surveillance testing of many of the key officials. So there's many benefits to rapid antigen testing. We know it well from flu tests though we know that in flu tests, we often then will have the PCR tests that if the rapid test were to be negative, we would then find out about in 24 hours. The benefits of this are that it's inexpensive. It can be a point of care test, though currently right now, we don't yet have an approved in the US point of care test for this. And there's close to 15 minute turnaround time from collecting a sample to getting the result. However, the limitations are great, and they're not specific or new to SARS-CoV-2, but it represents more of an issue when we think about what is the right population for us to be using these tests in. So we know that they have a lower sensitivity compared to uh, reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction tests. But the key thing, and the thing that we at least in the US are still struggling with, and I think will be so critical when we think about expanding this globally, particularly to resource limited settings, is the clinical performance uh, greatly depends on the circumstances in which they are used. Meaning that the specificity of this test in a low prevalent area in a population that is has a low pretest um, probability for having SARS-CoV-2 is quite poor hence leading to false negatives as well as false positive tests. There is not currently in the US approval to use these tests for asymptomatic screening, though the vast majority of scientists believe this would be the right application for it in the right setting if it was a higher prevalence setting. So lastly for testing, I'd like to just touch on antibody tests and the correlates of protection. And I'll use this when we then later in the presentation get back to vaccines. So really what I'm going to present to you today is just the myriad of questions that are still unanswered when it comes to antibody testing for SARS-CoV-2. What are the kinetics of antibody-mediated immune response to infection? Does it have to do with whether or not you have severe disease as compared to mild disease to know whether or not you're going to mount a stronger antibody response? And does having the presence of antibodies actually impact the clinical course and the severity of disease, knowing that you often develop somewhat of a response within prior to one week after having the infection? And so therefore, does that, for those who do, help to mitigate the severity of their disease? What about this question of cross-reactivity with different beta coronaviruses? And if there is this, does it actually lead to cross protection or does it just make us more challenged when we think about actually testing this given some of the limitations of our antibody assays? And then ultimately the holy grail that we want to know is will infection protect you from future infection? And if so, how long will antibody mediated immunity last? And what we need to then know when we think about how we translate this into vaccines as well as therapeutics is how good is serology as a surrogate for neutralizing activity? So while I won't be able to answer all those questions, I just wanted to highlight two key points of this. So on the left is uh, from a publication that came out just recently, two weeks ago in Nature Communications. And what it shows in panel A is that at the individual level, 
antibody response following the first infection exposure increases, then declines. Sometime later, individuals may be exposed to SARS-CoV-2 again. They may be protected from infection by their acquired immunity. But then their acquired immunity may also moderate the severity of infection with some possibility that pre-existing immunity may lead to immunopathogenesis. These individual level dynamics aggregate to form the population level seroprevalence. And therefore, you see in panel B on the left, measures of seroprevalence may imperfectly measure past exposure to infection due to antigenic diversity of future SARS-CoV-2 viruses and cross-reactivity of endemic human coronaviruses with SARS-CoV-2. And then panel C on the left shows that the measures of seroprevalence may also be inconsistent across times as antibody levels within individuals wane. On the right-hand side of the slide, this is from New England Journal of Medicine this summer, this showed what the longitudinal assessment of anti-SARS-CoV-2 receptor binding domain, IgG, in persons who have recovered from COVID-19. So trying to get at the fact of how long do we have these antibodies? So this was a small study that just looked at 34 participants, but it showed some very key findings. It showed that the um, uh, RBD serum IgG concentrations were quantified by enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay as equivalent binding activity to a concentration of a controlled monoclonal IgG for at least two time points here. Panel A shows a log-transformed IgG concentrations plotted against the time since the onset of symptoms in each participant, whereas panel B shows a linear regression model that was created to estimate the effects of the participant's age and gender the days from symptom onset to the first measurement, and the first measured log antibody level on the slope, reflecting the change in the anti-RBD antibody levels. This corresponds to a half-life of approximately 36 days over the observation period when adjusted for age, gender, and time and value of the first measurement. The protective role of antibodies against SARS-CoV-2 is unknown, but these antibodies are usually a reasonable correlate of antiviral immunity and anti-receptor binding domain antibody levels correspond to plasma viral neutralizing activity. Given that early antibody decay after acute viral antigenic exposure is approximately exponential, this study found that antibody loss was quicker than that reported for SARS-CoV-1. These findings raise concern that humoral immunity against SARS-CoV-2 may not be long lasting in persons particularly with mild illness who compose the majority of people with COVID-19. The clinical significance of SARS-CoV-2 binding and neutralizing antibody titers and their ability to predict efficacy need to be confirmed in trials and are very critical to when we think about efficacy of vaccines. Confirmation of the correlation between antibody titers and protection against COVID-19 really will only be able to be seen in these large phase three clinical efficacy studies. Optimization of the performance characteristics of these antibody assays is valuable in streamlining further development and supporting bridging across varied populations and manufacturing processes. I'd now like to turn it back to Dr. Delmonico. So Anne and I thought it would be important in conveying the uh, utility of testing for example, in our experience of organ donation and transplantation, when the COVID pandemic came about in principally in March, <clears throat> you can see the fall in living donor transplants and deceased donor transplants. Transplantation was virtually shut down. Next slide, Anne. However, because of the application of the science of testing, specifically the nasopharyngeal test and the bronchial alveolar lavage, we were able to discern that such testing would preclude the transmission of the virus in an organ transplant. <clears throat> As a result, you can see these graphs showing the blue bar is 2019 transplantation data and the green 2020. For deceased donor transplants, we're virtually back to where we were. There will be no difference as a result uh, of the COVID pandemic in the number of deceased donor transplants performed, and we're now catching up in living donor transplants. Next slide, Anne. Uh, that then again emphasizes the importance of science in the application of that scientific knowledge to our everyday practice. 
Obviously, what Anne has presented is so important for employment and schools and our everyday life, but transplantation becomes an example of how that science could be successfully applied to sustain the practice of transplantation worldwide. And it's done simply by obtaining the uh, respiratory tract nasopharyngeal BAL sample and not necessary either from blood or urine or stool. So these are important observations. Next slide, please. Monsignor, you asked about President Trump's treatment. And in the interest of time, President Trump was treated with an eight gram dose of an antibody cocktail made by the company Regeneron. And uh, I'll talk just briefly about the monoclonal antibodies. He was also treated with an antiviral drug, Remdesivir, and sim a simple steroid, dexamethasone, that has been shown to reduce deaths in patients mechanically ventilated or requiring supplemental oxygen, which was the clinical situation of President Trump. These monoclonal antibodies are derived from mice, genetically programmed mice that then produce human antibodies that have a very potent neutralizing effect on the spike protein. Uh, I should say just in a, a clinical note, Dr. Fauci was uh, interviewed just yesterday, the other day with by CNN and felt very strongly that these monoclonal antibodies likely have made a difference in the president's course. Next slide. In the interest of time, I had prepared a slide from the uh, National Academy of Science on the anatomy of the monoclonal antibody. But importantly, just to mention at this moment, the specificity of the antibody is profound. And it has a very high affinity for the spike protein. And as well, it is long lasting in its half-life. All right, uh, with that said, we go back to you, Anne, in terms of vaccines. Thank you. So just before we get into SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, what we need to know is that as we await the, or we anticipate, I'd say, the vaccine to prevent SARS-CoV-2, we know that history underscores the variability in development timelines for developing a safe and effective, effective vaccine for emerging infectious disease um, infections. So as you see here, this is just an illustration to see when you think about the last number of emerging infectious diseases since 25, in the past 25 years, and the few that have had vaccines that have been successfully developed. Of course, on the right, you have the impact of these viruses. And when this slide was um, first uh, made or depicted, you can see it was early on in our pandemic of COVID-19, we now have 35.7 million cases. Um, so therefore, the urgency to do so. And this is just another straight to say the same thing as far as with the timelines for the development of various vaccines have varied greatly from polio to Ebola to SARS-CoV-1 and MERS not having one, though they're still under development currently, but because those infections have essentially gone away, it's felt to, that those, though it's still being developed, has not been expedited in the same way of what we are trying to do with SARS-CoV-2. So this is just from Science at the end of May um, by Dr. Fauci, Dr. Collins, and Dr. Corey and Mascalo. They showed that it's unprecedented. That we'll, what this will need is an unprecedented collaboration and resources in order to develop a safe and effective vaccines for COVID-19 that can be manufactured and delivered in billions of doses globally. So what is the U.S. doing for this? They're really trying to have a harmonization of the vaccine trials. So there's about six to seven trials in, the, in which the U.S. federal government is playing a major role by helping to subsidize and providing harmonization of a common data safety monitoring board and developing common primary and secondary endpoints in which to compare the vaccines, as well as a common primary immunologic endpoint. So just when we think about the traditional vaccine development as compared to what we are trying to do for SARS-CoV-2, we see what the huge burden is with that. And ultimately what the main thing is just to highlight is the fact that the world has now witnessed the compression of six years of work into six months based on the fact of the number of vaccines that are currently already in phase three trials. And the main question is, will we be able to develop a safe and efficacious COVID-19 vaccine for the most vulnerable of our patients in the next three to six months. 
So this is just to have one slide to group all of the main vaccine candidates in the US and UK here. This is not at all meant to be representative. We know that there are close to 180 or so different um, developers, uh, both companies as well as academic institutions that are working on vaccines. I just chose to highlight a few that are close to phase three trials to just illustrate the point of this. So we have three separate platforms, the nucleic acid, which is mostly the messenger RNA based, viral vectors, which include the chimpanzee adenovirus vector, human adenovirus vector, VCV, and measles, as well as a recombinant protein subunit as a platform. We have many different developers, as you see in the next column. I'd like to highlight some of the key things for those um, vaccines that are have ongoing phase three trials. So for the Moderna vaccine, their plan that they have announced this week is that they are hoping to file an EUA submission at the end of November. Their goal is to have enrolled 30,000 participants, and this is a two vaccine, a two dose vaccine, um, as well as for Pfizer, that this initially started out as wanting to also enroll 30,000. They have currently enrolled 37,000 participants across multiple countries, and their goal is to enroll 44,000. They have already started the European Medicines Agency submission, which is a rolling submission for this vaccine. When we think about our recombinant viral vectors, as we know, unfortunately, the AstraZeneca and the collaboration with the University of Oxford was put on hold September or early September due to an adverse event of transverse um, myelitis in one of the participants in the UK. The vaccine trials have resumed in other countries, but they remain on hold still in the United States. The Janssen and Johnson & Johnson vaccine has a lot of uh, very good um, important fa factors compared to some of the other vaccines in the sense that it's a single dose. And therefore, they are also trying to roll larger by having 60,000 participants um, in that trial. And then we think about the recombinant protein subunit, the UK trial that is in company that is ongoing in phase three. The key for this is that this can be stored at two to eight degrees centigrade. And so therefore don't require a different vaccine um, as far as cold chain for that. And so making it more useful when you think about uh, rolling up in uh, implementation of this vaccine. Dr. Delmonico to, to conclude, please. So I, I wish to end by contrasting again the reflections of China and President Xi Jinping that were made at the World Health Assembly. I wish to underscore the comment of WHO Director Tedros in requesting a solidarity of the international community in providing the development of these vaccines for lower income countries, for all of mankind. And finally, in that last slide, that is the request of global leaders to come away from this um, nationalism, tribalism that has been uh, regrettably emphasized or, or conveyed by some political leaders uh, in, in, this, in this world. And as I say, regrettably, only to turn it back to the need for science to provide for the well being of mankind. And science is doing so through the development of these vaccines that must be widely distributed. I call upon President von Braun and Chancellor Sanchez to emphasize as a result of these deliberations, the need for solidarity in keeping with Pope Francis' recent encyclical regarding fraternity and the importance of that solidarity in its uh, application of science to the worldwide community and the betterment of mankind. Professor Singer, thank you for the opportunity of making these presentations and we are back to you, sir, as the chair.